if there's one subject the Bible speaks about more than any other, what do you think it is? All right, I'll tell you. The Bible speaks about money, about finances, more than it does about any other single subject, which ought to suggest to us that the subject of finance and money and money management is important and is important in the sight of God. Today, I'm in Eastern Tennessee, and my guest is Ed Reed, who has written the book about money management. Ed, thanks for joining me today. Well, it's a pleasure to be with you, John. Let's start by asking you why you think there's not a lot of time left for planet Earth. Why are these the last days? Well, the Bible gives two ways for us to know. The first one is the great prophetic timeline, and we see the time is running out. And then the other one are signs that Jesus gave us that we would see near the end, and they're in abundance today. Such as? Well, earthquakes, for example. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke, talk about the Synoptic Gospels. Earthquakes in different places near the end as an indication of end times. Okay, now devil's advocate. There's yeah. always been earthquakes. They had them back in Bible times. Why should we be concerned when another earthquake strikes today? Five of the largest earthquakes ever to occur on the earth have happened in the last 50 years of a 6,000 year history. Jesus in Matthew 24 said these signs would be like birth pains, didn't he? Yes. Which indicates that they'll become more frequent and more intense. Indeed. You think we're seeing that? I do indeed, yes. Okay. All right. Now, if it's true that we're getting close to the end of time, I, I believe that. I believe that. Many, many people watching today totally convinced of that. The Bible talks an awful lot about money and finance. Clearly a very important subject, very important to God. It's important to all of us. If we don't have it, life becomes a difficult proposition. How then should people of faith who are convinced that Jesus is returning sometime soon, and I know that word soon is a relative word, how should people be approaching their finances, keeping in mind the end might be near? Well, I think the first thing to do is to put God first in your life. I could give you, you know, a long time, a big uh, uh, recitation of, you know, things to do, budgeting and all of that. But I think the book of Proverbs, the third chapter, talks about honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first part of all your increase and your barns will be filled with planting your vats with new wine and so on. Those are written to farmer people, but they, they apply to us in the same way. And it says, don't be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil and so on. So the, I think putting God first. Okay, now, now let me ask you a question. Right there in Proverbs 3, honor the Lord with your substance. Yes. What does that mean? Well, I use the New King James Version. It says your possessions, your stuff, we would say. Yep. Honor the Lord with your stuff. And this means, well, you mentioned that the Bible talks more about money than any other subject, any other single subject. And more than 2,000 verses talk about it. Somebody asked me, well, what is your favorite one? Well, it's not even a money one, but Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So if God's the creator, I'm a creature. If he's the creator, he's the owner, and I'm just a manager. So the way I manage God's money is a very, very important situation. Uh, I believe that we're saved by faith alone, the great Protestant tradition. But the fact is, we're not saved by our money management, but we can manage away from God. Do you get what I'm saying by that? We can move away in our management, Certainly. thinking in terms of selfishness and so on. In fact, one of the signs of the end is in 2 Timothy, the third chapter, where it says, in the last days, perilous times will come, and men will be lovers of themselves, or selfish, and lovers of money. Mm. That's an amazing one. And then also the fifth chapter of James in the first five verses says, the rich will heap up treasures for the last days. It's all going to get burned up. And that's the amazing thing. But the interesting thing is they're doing it. Let me give you an illustration of last day stuff. Sure. If I'm a professional person with advanced degrees, and I could earn about 100000 a year, in my entire lifetime, and this is amazing, of 40 years of working, I will make $4 million. Recently, even during the economic downturn, some of the Wall Street bankers got bonuses of $40 million, which is 10 times more than a professional person will make in his entire lifetime of hard work. Now, this is incredible to understand. The rich are saving up for the last days. Sure. They could not be a, a better example of that, in my opinion. So now we're talking about honoring the Lord with our substance, honoring yes. with our possessions, our stuff. Planning for the last days of, of Earth's history. Now, I don't expect that you're going to be an extremist on this. I don't think you're going to be a radical on this. 
How do we go about that? What should we be thinking? The very first thing I'm telling people now, people say, well, is it time to get back into the market? Should we start investing again? And I tell people, if you have any debt at all, investing in your own debt is the very best thing you can do. Guaranteed returns, better interest rate that you can get if your money's in there, even the stock market where you could lose it. Many people have, as you may know. And the amazing thing about it is people, even on credit card debt, the average year now, $915 billion dollars a month is not paid off on credit cards that are carried over from month to month. Minimum 10%, probably many of those up to 27%. People are paying those kind of balances and not paying off their credit cards. So I would say after putting God first in your life, which is managing from God's perspective, and that would include the tithe and so on, but then the very best thing you can do, practical management, do your very best to get out of debt. Okay, you mentioned credit card debt. Yeah. What other debts are people carrying? Well, I'll just give you, for example, automobiles. Almost everybody who's making time payments on a car actually owes more on it than it's worth. Mm -hmm. So I'm suggesting, and I practice this myself, drive your car at least 10 years, and then you get twice its value out of it. Take care of it, manage, you know, instead of having to have a new one. Many new cars are sold on looks, as you know. Somebody on TV, you see them driving down the neighborhood and everybody runs out in their porch to see somebody's new car. It doesn't tell you what kind of mileage it gets, how long it will last or anything. It's just, well, we need a new car. The bottom line is take care of your car and drive it a long time. Then you're not upside down in the mortgage. Now, now you're suggesting now, you're suggesting, uh, I want that new car, man. You know, you're, you're suggesting that I, I might need to take a look at how I'm ordering my priorities and, 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 and yeah, I might, I might want that. I well, might really want that new car, Ed. You told me not to be radical, but I'm going to be radical in one thing. In an ideal world, people would pay cash for their cars. So once you get your car paid off, if you save up the equivalent of the car payment until you have enough to pay cash, by the way, if you pay cash, you're going to think twice about, do I really want to spend 30000 of my money on this car? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, whereas if you're putting down a down payment and paying it off over 10 years, it, it doesn't seem quite so painful. When That's in actual true. fact, it's way more painful. Yes, maybe 50% more by doing that over time. Okay, so we're looking at, we, looked, we looked at a couple of things right now. One of them, getting out of debt, looking after yourself by paying down your debt and being free from debt. We talked about cars. I'm sure we're going to talk about some more things in a moment. Money management, stewardship as the approach of Jesus is near. Thanks for joining me today. Don't go away. I'll be back in just a moment. In Matthew 4, 4, the Word of God says, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every Word is a one-minute Bible-based daily devotional presented by Pastor John Bradshaw and designed especially for busy people like you. Look for Every Word on selected networks or watch it online every day on our website, itiswritten.com. Receive a daily spiritual boost. Watch Every Word. You'll be glad you did. Thanks for being with me today. I'm joined today by Ed Reed, who has literally written the book on money management and on Bible prophecy. And today we're looking at how a person should plan financially, keeping in mind that Jesus' return is near. A moment ago, Ed, we were talking about uh, how important it is that a person should want, want to get out of debt. We looked at what some of those debts might be. You mentioned clearing uh, car payments. Credit uh, cards. What, what are some other, and credit cards, thanks. Mm -hmm. What are some other areas that, that people typically carry debt on that they might, and perhaps even relatively easily, clear those debts, get out of debt? Well, a lot of people don't think about this, but I actually encourage people to prepay the principal on their home mortgage. Uh, houses cost so much today because there's credit available, so we almost always have to get a loan very few people have the cash to do it. So I encourage people to get an amortization schedule and prepay principal. Like when you make a regular payment, make another payment's principal each month if you can. Pay your house off in half the time. Okay, explain that a little more slowly. All right. If you have an amortization schedule, it has like five columns in it. And one of them is the number of the, of the payment, like one to 360. And then it's how much the payment itself is, how much goes to the bank for interest, how much of that is principal and what your balance is. And every time you make one regular payment, which you have to do every month, add next month's principal payment, which is a much smaller sum. For some people, it'd be like $150. When you do that, then you've paid two payments in one, and the next time you the third payment. So you can pay it off in half the time. 
That's incredible. I've done that two times in my life. So you can pay it off in half the time without paying twice as much money. Oh, yes. Yeah, that's incredible. It's amazing, really. You save thousands, literally thousands. Okay, someone, someone's writing a note furiously to themselves. They're trying to remember what you said. Let's make it easy for people. If someone wants to review this, that information you gave, how can they, how can they find that information real quick? Well, you can just look at an amortization schedule. You can find the amortization for your loan online, for example, print it off, and then you can easily see what I've just said. Are banks happy when people choose to do this? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. But that's not really the point here, is it? No, as long as there's not a prepayment penalty, and most loans today don't have one, you can do that very easily. Okay, talking about getting out of debt, because I don't think it'd be wise to be carrying a whole bunch of debt into uh, troublous times that are coming. Yeah. How's a person supposed to uh, get out of debt if, say, that they're wanting to buy a house? Like you said, yeah. not everybody can go and pay cash for a house. Uh, you, you pretty well got to borrow money to buy a house. What's the right approach? I would suggest uh, a couple of things. One of them is make sure you put 20% down so you don't have private mortgage insurance to pay. That's something you, that just guarantees your loan to the bank and it doesn't benefit you in any way. So have a 20% down payment minimum. Uh, in addition to that, uh, this, every time you prepay a payment, it builds your own net worth. If the economy were to tank really bad, most people that don't prepay are upside down on their mortgage, which means they owe more on it than it's worth. But if you've prepaid, that shouldn't be a bother to you. So it's better to do that, in my opinion. Uh, and, and I will just tell you that right now, today, aside from in times, we're having 10,000 Americans retire every day of the week starting this year, and this will last for 10 years in a row. This is the baby boomer generation. And people know they're ready to retire when they have their debts paid off, including their home mortgage, when they have a reasonable income stream, and they have health insurance. So just to prepare for end, time, for end times would be the same thing, in my opinion. Try to be debt free, so no matter what comes in the future, it does not adversely affect you. Okay, give me some more. What other principles of money management, financial, wise financial planning, stewardship, should people be entertaining when they're thinking Jesus is coming back soon? Because I've heard people say, the Lord's coming back. It doesn't yeah. matter. Let's, let's rack up debt. Let's do, just go nuts because the Lord's coming back and we won't have to worry about it. I've, That's irresponsible. I've heard that as well, but I really believe that the, the Bible says in Psalm 37, 21, the wicked borrow and do not repay. It is not a Christian perspective to rack up debts and walk off from them. In addition to that, before God's people are taken to heaven, we're going to have a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. And the people that are in debt are going to have the worst time of it, essentially losing everything. So I think we need to have a focus away from this earth and toward our kingdom. I would suggest very sincerely that the more we can, we should support ministries like it is written and others with any available cash. It's not going to be good at some time in the future. And all the stuff we have is going to get burned up someday. It's true, isn't it? Now we have an opportunity to do something with our yes. funds that one day we're simply not going to be able to do. Yes. Think of all the money that was lost in the downturn in the economic markets from 2008 and 2009. If that money alone that people lost had been put into ministries, we would have more money than we knew what to do with. We're talking about millions, even billions of dollars lost from the portfolios of many Americans. Mm -hmm. Okay. Financial stewardship, looking towards uh, the return of Jesus. Take us a step further with this. Well, another thing that I would say is right now we have very high unemployment. We need to be employed so that we can help support our families and do the work of God. So I would suggest do all you can to stay uh, employed. In other words, be a diligent worker. And it's interesting, uh, Proverbs 22 talks about, show me a man who's diligent in his work and he will stand before kings, not yes. mere men. Be the best employee that you can be. That's important. And if you don't have a job, I would suggest that you take any job that you can that doesn't violate your conscience. You wouldn't want to be a go-go dancer or a bartender or something, but most any job would be of, of value to you if you didn't have a job. It's important, isn't it, that people put themselves in a position, and I, I say this kindly because I know some people are out of work and would, would do anything they can to change that. Yeah. Uh, it's important to be to make yourself as employable as possible. Oh, yes. What are some simple things, just very simple things somebody can do to enhance their employability? Well, you can find out, for example, what kind of jobs are available now. For example, healthcare, uh, 
in the economy right now, go to a hospital parking lot, you can hardly find a place to park. Very few healthcare workers have lost their jobs. There's not very much unemployment in that area. Train yourself for some level of healthcare, you know, nursing, inhalation therapy, you know, whatever it might be, lab tech, whatever. Those are things that are important. Computers are still important. Everybody gets their stuff on their cell phones and their computers and so on. Computer guys are staying busy and they're making good incomes, much more than preachers, as you may know. Yeah, yeah, moving right along. Um, what other advice can we give people who are thinking about the end of time and wondering what to do, how to manage their finances wisely? I would say live within your means. Make a budget. This is kind of like going on a diet for most people. They don't want to do that, but make a simple budget. Here's what my income is. Here's what my expenses are each month. Live within your means. Let me give you a simple illustration. Because of the bombardment of advertising today, most people think they need more stuff. But most of us can get along just fine with the stuff we already have. In fact, I ask people, how many of you think you have stuff you'll never use as long as you live? And almost everybody raises their hand. Have a yard sale, sell off stuff, put that money on your debts and so on. But if you don't think you can live within your means or you're too poor to save, visit a third world country like Haiti or go to central India, some of those places, and you'll realize that you're very rich. If you have a car in any condition, you're in the top 5% of the people in the whole world. So let's just learn to live within our means, and that's going to be a very helpful thing near the end times. You can't afford to get further in debt. This is kind of a tail onto the one of getting out of debt, but certainly don't go further in debt. A simple idea, live within your means, yet so many people find it very, very difficult to do that. We're talking today about financial management, stewardship, money management, keeping in mind that Jesus is coming back soon. I'll have more with Ed Reed in just a moment. Planning for your financial future is a vital aspect of Christian stewardship. For this reason, It Is Written is pleased to offer free planned giving and estate services. For information on how we can help you, please call 800-992-2219. Call today or visit our website, hislegacy.com. Call 800-992-2219. If something in today's program has sparked your interest in deeper Bible study, visit our website, itiswritten.com, where you'll find a host of spiritual resources and free Bible study guides. You'll find a complete archive of past It Is Written programs available in script form so you can read or download them. Plus, you can watch a program you've missed via streaming video. Pay a visit to itiswritten.com today and be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for joining me today on It Is Written. My guest today is Ed Reed, an accomplished speaker and author, and uh, you may not want me using this word, Ed, but an expert in, in, in the fields of uh, financial management and Bible prophecy. We're talking today about how believers in Jesus should approach finances, keeping in mind that Jesus is returning, we believe, soon. Now, the last thing we spoke about, you know, really, this is the sort of thing we could talk about all day, how important it is for a person to live within their means. Yes. If you have $10, don't spend 11 which means that if I have an income of X and I want to buy an automobile that really be belongs to someone who has an income of Y or X times 3, I might want to scale back my expectations a little bit, right? I think so. Yes, and let me just suggest also that it's a good idea to have a little savings. Even if you have a smaller income than you would like, I would suggest saving something out of every paycheck. And this is not for retirement. What I'm talking about here is doing something for emergency sake. Okay, now someone, she, she's sitting here watching the program. She, she, she's, she's at home raising her two and a half kids, and dad has a job, and, and he's, it's, it's not a high paying job. And she's saying, this guy's saying, save? I can't even get the groceries paid for each week. I would budget savings just like grocery or utilities. And it could be a small amount, like $50 every paycheck or something. But when you can build that up, many financial counselors suggest having at least $1,000 for emergency and try to have the general savings is three to six months equivalent of living expenses in an emergency savings fund that you can draw upon should you have transmission problems in your car, your refrigerator goes out, you have a health emergency that your insurance doesn't cover, those kind of things. This isn't for a trip to Disneyland. No, no, no. And the real interesting thing I would tell you is uh, even eating out is kind of incredible. Uh, I would suggest that if you eat out once a day, it doubles your family's food budget for the month. So eating out should be a special occasion, you know, for a special thing, birthdays, anniversaries, that kind of thing. 
And, and, and the most amazing thing is to show you that Americans need that. Go to any well-known restaurant today and you have to wait to get in. Even though there's a downturn in the economy, people are still eating out. I have wondered, I have marveled, as a matter of fact, many times that the economy is apparently in such bad shape that restaurants are full. Yes, isn't that incredible? Yeah, that's not something you have to do, eat out. You, right. You, sometimes, perhaps, but you could work that. You could work that another way, couldn't you? Lack of savings is the biggest reason that people go in debt. They don't intend to go in debt, but something happens to their car or, you know, something like that. They have to then go put it on the credit card and then they pay for it two or three times over. Now, what about investing? Now, I, I know we've got to be careful here. We can't tell people what to invest and what yes. not to invest. In. How should a person approach investing? Well, this is a very good question because obviously wise and prudent people don't spend everything they make. As I said before, live within your income. But you would have to think in terms of the future when you can't work as gainfully as you used to or should you lose your job or whatever. So I would suggest, first of all, invest in your own debts. That's the very best investment anyone can make. Guaranteed res uh, return. For example, if you have money in a CD, you might be getting 1% or 2%. But if you're paying off your credit cards, you're making 10% or 27%. So that's an investment that I would recommend. But another thing is, in these unusual times, and by the way, your question is so good that I want to insert this, beware of get-rich-quick schemes. Mm. There's hucksters out there that want to get your money. And so I would suggest that people always counsel with someone else before investing somewhere. This great thing comes along. By the way, most get-rich-quick schemes are introduced to people by their friends who sincerely believe they're doing their friends a favor. But you have to really look at it. Something you don't understand, you have to invest quickly. You know, you're going to promise high returns, all of that. And I'm just going to tell you, avoid those at all costs. Uh, uh, even if it makes you you know, so you're not friends with that person because you're going to end up not being friends anyway. Typically with investing, isn't it true? If something seems too good to be true. Oh, yes, it almost always is. That's yeah. true. Yeah. And the real interesting thing about investments, I would say, even though the government is trillions of dollars in debt, probably the safest investment are government backed securities because the government has the unique ability to print money if they need to. But, uh, you know, it's it's the kind of the standard. So I would suggest if you have to put money away that you're not investing in your own debts, put it in a secure position. Because if you could make more in the stock market, the higher the level of income offered, the greater risk it is. That's always true, whether the people telling you believe it or not, whether you believe it or not, whether it seems possible even. The higher the interest promise, the greater the risk. It's always true. Now, if Jesus is coming back soon, if the, end, if the end is near, and I don't say that, in fact, I don't say that as a doom merchant, I say that full of hope. Aren't we all excited? Yeah, yes. wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah. How important is it that a person really keeps an eye on the future? Well, I'll just give you this. Christians, Bible believers, have inside information. Now, in the investing world, that's not a good idea to have, you know. <laughs> but we have inside information, and it's in Second Peter, the third chapter, verse 10, that when the Lord returns, the earth will get burned up in all the works of men. And as I tell people, that will reduce its value considerably. All the stuff gets burned up. So I would say as a Christian, uh, you know, get rid of your stuff uh, that you don't need. A lot of us have things we've carried around for years that we really don't need. Divest yourself of stuff you don't need. Sell it at yard sales. Now, here's the real story. Christians are going to work together for the greatest event ever, and that's to work together to finish the work of God on this earth. Yes. And it's not going to be free. God's going to ask us to utilize stuff he's given us. Remember, honor the Lord with your possessions, your stuff. And that's not one of the ways we do it, helping to finish the work of God. So I think another thing, this earth is not our final home. We have dual citizenship as Christians, citizens here of whatever country we're in and citizenship in heaven when we accept Christ. So we're moving from one to the other. And we want to move our assets from here to, to the new earth uh, so that we can uh, be blessed and to bless others at the same time. Okay, let's go to the Bible. A couple of verses, a couple of Bible verses that you believe are especially helpful, especially pertinent to people as they're wanting to honor the Lord with what they have, keeping in mind time is short. Well, I would think of 1 John. Uh, that's a very interesting one. Chapter 2, I believe I have it marked here in my Bible so I can find it quickly. And verses 15 to 17 says something similar to Second Peter that I just mentioned. Don't love the world or the things in the world. And the, if you do, the love of the Father is not in you because all that's in the world, the lust of the eyes and so on, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And that's just giving this point. The world is passing away and the lust of it, but he that does the will of God abides forever. That's 1 John 2, 17. So what that says to me is, 
it's not going to pass away. It is in the process of passing away. With all of the natural disasters and things, the world is waxing old like a garment, as it says in the Bible. And we have to understand, I believe in ecology. I believe in separating my trash and all that kind of stuff. But we're not going to save the planet. The Bible is clear. It is passing away. And the lust of it, but he that does the will of God abides forever. So I would say that as you read through the scripture, look for the will of God. Put that part in your life. How about we pray together? Because a lot of people are taking on board what you've said today and said, Lord, some things have got to change around here. That's true. I've got to get it right now. And it's not going to happen unless people are praying their way through this. It's us pray together, shall we? Okay. Our Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus that you are willing to guide us in some of the most practical and important areas of our lives. There are a few things more practical than our, than our daily finances. We're all confronted with the importance of them and sometimes confounded by them. As we've talked today, Ed and I, I pray that you would, you would guide us all as we seek to honor you with our stuff and our possessions and our finances, as we seek to plan prudently with the return of Jesus so imminent. I pray your Holy Spirit will guide us and keep us. Let your will be done. Please be first in our lives and let us face the future with confidence, confidence that comes from though we are honoring you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Today, we've been talking about crucial financial issues that affect all of us. Our goal at It Is Written is to help you live a more satisfying and God-centered life. So this week, our free offer is a helpful book on finance called God Will Provide. It's a practical discussion on how a faithful God has promised to provide for the needs of His faithful children and includes a special section prepared by Ed Reed on managing finances in difficult times. Please call or write us and this free book will be on its way to you. There's no cost and no obligation. Just call 1-800-253-3000 and ask for the book, God Will Provide. If the line's busy, please keep trying. You can also request this free book by writing to It Is Written, Box 6, Chattanooga, Tennessee, 37401, and we'll mail a copy to your address in North America. Please note, this free book is limited to the supply on hand. For immediate access, you can download a free electronic version of the book, God Will Provide, from our website, itiswritten.com. It Is Written is a faith-based ministry made possible by viewers like you. If you wish to help the worldwide outreach of It Is Written, your tax-deductible gift may be sent to the same address. Or you can make a gift online at itiswritten.com. And thank you for joining me today. I look forward to seeing you again next time. Until then, remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God.